All right, welcome everybody. Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors, and uh, we're back with Kevin Gordon, President of Capital Advisors for another K-12 Politics and Tech Update. Kevin, glad to be back with you here. Great, it's good to be with you again, Tim. Yeah, so no shortage of news this week. Lots and lots of stuff going on, uh, even up to last night. <laughs> there was a, a lot, in, and this morning there's more. But can you just give us a little recap of what's happening in, uh, in Sacramento in regards to, to, to the Senate and what they're talking about in terms of cuts? You bet. So, I mean, a really, really amazing meet week with the state Senate essentially rejecting the governor's major cuts to public education in, in a couple of key areas, um, which, you know, I'll go over in just a second. But the main thing I wanted to talk about was that he actually just the state Senate takes a different approach to triggers than the governor does, which is that the governor's budget assumes that we don't get federal funding builds a budget full of cuts around that assumption. And then if the federal dollars come through, he what he calls trigger off some of these cuts that would apply to education. Well, what the state Senate does, they build a budget that assumes that we actually get some level of federal relief. They build the budget around that. And then if we don't get the federal relief, then they would implement cuts. It would trigger cuts. But the interesting thing for education, it does not trigger cuts in education. So whether the federal funds materialize or not, there are no cuts to LCFF or categorical programs that are involved if, in fact, uh, we don't get the federal dollars. That's actually in the Senate's plan. Now, that still has to go to the Assembly, but I just about fell off my chair when I saw this plan, and it was basically the mood of legislators, but the Senate really and the Assembly alike. Rank-and-file members are not happy with the fact that the disproportionality of cuts in the May revision hits education just so hard. So the key things to notice, no cuts to LCFF in the Senate plan, no cuts to categoricals. It keeps the added pots of federal funding, because we obviously got that, um, in, in substantially the same way the governor sends it out. They make some important adjustments that we had in the advisory that Jerry Shelton sent out from us yesterday to all of our clients, so they would have gotten that. But then also, the 2.31% COLA actually gets funded in the Senate plan. So, first of all, I mean, this sounds refreshing based on what we were dealing with last week. And let's hope it's more uh, like what the Senate's proposing than, than sort of the grim picture that was painted uh, last week by the governor. And I guess one thing that's been a big topic of conversation is potential layoffs. So how, how does that COLA um, that you just mentioned, how does that impact people with, with layoffs here? Right. And so because this Senate plan, and we'll see if the Assembly does it, would presumably fund the 2.31% COLA, it's part of their, their objectives there, it wouldn't trigger an opportunity for school districts to do August layoffs because the COLA would be in excess of 2%. And that's where the law would give you that latitude to do some layoffs if you needed it when the COLA is less than that on the local control funding formula. So it basically overrides that issue. I've always said from the beginning, there's a real simple solution to the layoff issue. Fund us, don't do the cuts, and make sure that the COLA is over 2%. The Senate steps up to that and does that. Uh, a lot of pressure on the Assembly going into their sort of markup on all of this today. It's expected today. We'll see if they do meet today and how close they get to the Senate plan. A lot of talk in the Capitol all day yesterday about the Assembly being very close to the Senate plan in terms of what it looks like for education. So a lot of optimism, a lot of excitement. I mean, the big question, Tim, that people are asking is, how do you not cut schools deeply when we constitute so much of the overall budget? And the answer is, is that they do make assumptions in this plan about an infusion of money from the federal government that obviously would have a disproportionate benefit on us with regard to this plan. But then they've got a lot of cuts uh, in other areas, not K-12. But then the other really significant area is in the area of deferrals. So they do keep the deferral that the governor was proposing for the current year for us in education across K-14. They also keep the deferral that the governor had originally planned that would happen in the budget year next year. And then if the federal dollars do not show up, while we don't necessarily get cut, we get what I call the mother of all deferrals. It would be a $9 billion deferral in a single year. And remember that all through uh, the Great Recession, 
we only totaled $10 billion in total deferrals then. So to hit $9 billion in one year is a little scary. But I, I've talked to lots of school superintendents, and, and they agree a lot better than, than actual real cuts to school programs. Yeah, and I guess uh, I, I don't know if we we can talk about this enough, but when it comes to you know funding, uh, you know people are really on the on the on the edge of their seats in terms of like ADA versus uh, you know versus enrollment. Can you talk a little bit about I guess what you're hearing on that front as well? Because I know yeah. I know folks need some support there. No, really good point. I almost forgot to mention it, but you're right. So uh, they do have embedded in the Senate plan an ADA hold harmless next year that solves most of the problem they do they are very concerned and and this speaks to both houses the senate and the assembly in fact even the governor is a little concerned about the issue of accountability that if we're going to basically do a hold harmless on ada and you're going to get the money no matter what that, that we've got to figure out a way to create some motive to can be concerned about the kids that are not showing up the kids that are not doing the distance learning we can't just have them get lost in the mix here. And so the Senate plan does have conditions on that open-ended ADA hold harmless so that it's got some accountability in it. And that gets detailed in some of the advice that we give out in our advice to clients that you know many of you are seeing. So, And then the other reason why I don't want to sort of torture you with some of these details is because we want to wait to see what the assembly does, and then we finally get you know a proposal that's going to gel here we can get a lot more into those details. One of the things that the proposal doesn't address are we do have some districts out there that are consistently growing in ADA, and they budget on that, and they do their three-year forecast predicated on that growth in ADA, is that they would actually suffer cuts uh, in their budget because they're anticipating that if all you're doing is holding them harmless for prior year. But, you know, I'm not sure that that's going to get addressed here. I know that policymakers are aware of the issue. Well, we'll keep our eye on it and uh, definitely look forward to more updates, you know, ASAP. You know, I know you, you're kind enough to send out some email updates to clients, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this certainly next week as, uh, as events unfold. Uh, yeah, I, do I was going to say uh, that I know that there's some tech issues that you're going to cover that are kind of important things to flag that people need to know about. But I wanted to mention that after you get done with a couple of those items, I'm also going to talk a little bit about these guidelines that the Department of Education is expected to be putting out. It leaked in the press, so there's some of the news is already out there. But um, I'll talk about that after there were a couple of issues in particular that I know you were going to cover that we talked about earlier. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And uh, one of the big ones is the FCC this week issued uh, warnings about COVID-related scams. And what's happening now is uh, cyber Cybercrime's up. We know that. We've talked about it before. But they're actually targeting people with what looks to be legitimate data from the CDE or World Health Organization. Uh, and, and, and it's about data and, you know, maybe outbreaks, you know, how things are trending. I would recommend that you don't open any of those. If it came to you, question it. And if you're interested in that information, please go online and seek it out. The FCC doesn't issue warnings like this uh, haphazardly. This is a serious, serious issue and you're putting your data uh, and your networks at risk if you are just sort of clicking on emails. And again, they could look very legitimate. So I would say, make sure you're seeking out information. Only open things right now from people that you know and trust. And if there's any links or you know hyperlinks in something that it came to you over email, please be very, very careful. Uh, number two, remember a few weeks ago, we spoke about the AP, uh, AP testing, the college board, incompatibility with Microsoft and some of the challenges there. You've probably seen this on social media and in the news that this has blown up uh, and now it's it's uh, you know, there's lawsuits. There's all kinds of um, let's just say uh, unhappy folks with this process. And I, I will say the College Board committed to be compatible with uh, both Apple and Android and the folks who had those devices felt, you know, safe enough to go ahead and take the test. Well, it turns out that they weren't compatible with iPhones. There was a certain codec with the cameras. You take a picture of what you uh, had done. You're supposed to submit it into the test. It was actually breaking the test and failing kids. So just like we said it the first time we brought this up, this is an equity issue. The kids who don't have the exact right device with the exact right software don't have the same ability to take these important tests 
to get to the colleges they want to go to. And again, we're just going to, we want to make you aware that this is a serious issue. You're probably aware now. Uh, and we want to, you know, encourage you to put some pressure as much as you can on the college board and the folks that, that issue these tests so that we can get the grace we need to get, uh, you know, to, to have either the time or, uh, or, or some sort of forgiveness on, on uh, getting these test scores submitted. So it is a major issue right now. It's impacting a lot of people. This is not gonna go away and, uh, and make sure you just educate yourself on, on some of the details. And um, go ahead, I was Tim. gonna say, Tim, I, I appreciate your raising that issue because you brought it up a couple of weeks ago on this little broadcast that we have with the idea that we could try to put some pressure on AP to work a little harder about the way it was going to interact, and and you kind of called it on this one. Well, hey, you know it's unfortunate you don't want things to materialize in this way, but uh, you know you just talk to any kids in your life that are in 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 uh, high school trying to get these tests done, and you'll hear the stress from them and from their families, uh, you know, because these tests are, are high stakes. So yeah, and th so those were a couple of points. I got a couple more, but Kevin, you you talked about um, reopening guidance, and that's on everybody's mind. I'm seeing a lot of articles i'm seeing you know like four page documents you know and and who who i guess who do we listen to the cde came out with something talk to us a little bit what, what cde issued yeah so they actually were supposed to issue the guidance on on thursday uh yesterday they did do a call uh the state superintendent did do a call with some folks outlining what the guidance was going to look like on wednesday as at least that's what we understood to be the case and then uh, then they were going to release it sort of publicly, this sort of guidance officially. And uh, it ended up getting leaked. Uh, Politico and the San Francisco Chronicle uh, got their hands on this stuff and leaked it. And for whatever reason, it's ended up delaying its release. So we're expecting we might see it today. It could actually get bumped into next week. But it has just a lot of issues in it. That, and as in the reported stories, of course, the reporters did their work. They went out and talked to all of you guys, superintendents, people that are on the ground in schools. And there was a lot of pushback about how practical some of this stuff really was or wasn't. I mean, the idea of daily temperature checks as people come on board into schools, the six feet of separation at all times, the hand washing stations, the masks, the idea of grouping kids um, with their classes, but within six feet of each other in cordoned off areas on the playground during recess and just a lot of sort of logistical things that suggest, um, you know, really practical problems for school districts in terms of how they really will, will be applied. And so there's a concerns about all of that. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing to understand is that it's guidance. But the one thing that we're always trying to impart to our friends in Sacramento, either the governor's office or CDE or anywhere, is that when you're giving guidance, there are parents who take that guidance, and if the school district isn't doing the guidance, it's almost like a de facto mandate, is that they'll shove it into the face of local school administrators and say, you're supposed to be doing it. They'll, they take guidance as being law or statute. So we can put it out as guidance to just give advice, and I think school districts have a good sense of what maybe they ought to do or ought not to. And I think maybe if there was a policy think piece or a paper, that talked about issues that ought to be considered that could be helpful. But I think the guidance in a lot of places is gonna be viewed by communities as a requirement on school districts. And some school districts are pushing back saying some of this stuff just isn't very practical. And that's scary. I think uh, for me, it's one of those big sort of lurking gotchas is the cost of reopening that you just don't know yet, right? And right. you know, your, your custodial staff is gonna get you X distance do they have do you have the equipment that you need to clean to the standards that we're all going to be called to clean to i mean right. that that in and of itself can be challenging so uh so i think there's there's a lot of guidance needed there are some pretty helpful things out there a good friend of mine uh paul vallis who was uh the former ceo of chicago public schools new orleans after katrina is managed through crisis he's issued actually a little bit of guidance oh it's like kind of an overview but it's very very relevant so if you get a chance uh you know he's he's a very well respected uh, national figure he's put out some some guidance i would encourage you to check that out and maybe if you're comfortable uh, we can put a little link to that as well because you put that out uh for free just trying to help districts and uh i had a couple more things here kevin that i think are really important if i can just touch on those you bet one is you know Cybersecurity, we, we, we can talk about this. Uh, we can't talk about it enough, I feel like, because it is one of the biggest areas of risk for all districts today. And I will recommend that if you have not yet done so, 
please start thinking about getting a cybersecurity assessment for your district based on this new re reality of remote staff and students. You may have had a cybersecurity assessment in the past or not at all. And I will say you can't really live without one now. So put it on your roadmap of things to get to when you have time, but make sure you engage someone, have someone sort of like look under the hood, make sure you have the right stuff in place to protect your students, your staff, yourselves, and your data. Uh, it's worth, an ounce of prevention is worth 10 pounds of the cure there. And then finally, I was, I mean, please. I yeah. wanted to stop you there for a second, Tim, because you know, if I'm a district and I'm hearing that, I immediately think about there's all kinds of different people out there that are going to offer solutions. So the price tag can vary all over the place that someone might offer up. I have no clue what something like that would cost a district. So, and I don't know if you have an answer just sort of in response to that question, but the other thing I was going to offer that I think school districts should think about doing, if they want to shoot you an email, they're getting a proposal from somebody and, and they want to to get your reaction to whether or not somebody is way outside of what's reasonable or not. Um, I think that would be really, really helpful. Uh, I don't know that you would do that, but I think it would be really helpful. I'd be happy to answer questions. We put, we can put my email in the, uh, in the email, my email address in the email that goes out this week and right. we'd be ha happy to answer questions. Uh, right. Let's just say that if you ask the right people in the right way, you could potentially get something at little to no cost because what they're, do they're gonna do is they're gonna take a gamble. They'll give you a, maybe sort of like a, at least an overview assessment in the hopes that they're going to win your business to like remedy whatever might be wrong. So there are some, some, uh, some levers you can pull, but just a, a quick answer to your question is there, you're probably working with someone right now that has the capability to do this if you ask them. And we can, you know, we can talk through that a little bit more, but the folks that sell you your network, they are very capable of running some kind of cybersecurity assessment. And you may, you know, maybe one of the 8,000 unanswered emails in your inbox right now, but I would say definitely um, work with the folks that are working with your network right now. You can ask, certainly ask questions to me uh, and I'd be happy to answer them for you. But this is really important because I'll just say whatever the cost is, the cost of losing your data and trying to get it back is going to be a mountain of cost compared to the ounce of prevention of having someone just sort of give you some recommendations. And I bet you there's some free things you can do to put yourself in a better position. So great, great question. Great comments. Um, so my final thing was I was on a call with a large school district uh, this week and they had a pretty clever idea. They're having a hard time getting hotspots as we've talked about before. Um, they are actually looking to buy only computers that have the ability to put a SIM card in the computer. And just so for, for the folks that don't know what a SIM card is, when you buy a cell phone, you pull the SIM card out of your old phone, you pop it in the new one, and that is your basically your cell number. So it turns the computer basically into its own hotspot. What makes that compelling is right now, if you send a kid a computer and a hotspot, now you have two devices to keep track of, inventory, support, in case something goes wrong. And you have to have, uh, you know, you have to worry about updating that thing. If you have a computer that supports a SIM card, you could switch pr uh, providers anytime. You could, you know, you could, you know, change your plans and you could pop a different SIM card in when you need it uh, without having to support multiple devices. So. I, I thought that was a wonderful idea and a wonderful workaround with the lack of equipment as we've been talking about in these broadcasts. So if you get a chance, there's a slight premium to pay for a laptop that has that capability, but you can get Chromebooks, you can get PCs that support those SIM cards and effectively will be their own hotspot. So keep that in mind when you're out there uh, searching and hunting for devices. And uh, and with that, Kevin, that's, that's what I had on the tech side. Any final Great. thoughts from you before we wrap up? No, I think we're there. We'll give you guys updates, obviously, on what's happening at the Capitol. We got the assembly to go, and then obviously the governor's going to get involved with this. We're going to have a budget sooner than, I think, the 15th. So we'll see, as long as people are getting along, and we, we hope that's the case. Well, yeah, and I just want to throw in one more thing. You know, Remember, the YouTube channel, it, we're going to be posting these. You subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the little bell. You're going to get notified when we post new videos. And uh, we had a, we did a federal funding update with uh, Governor Wise this week. So he was kind of tell, talking about what's going on. Next week we'll have Governor Wise on this broadcast, uh, and and you know we'll, we'll we'll have Kevin and 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 uh, and Governor Wise really kind of talking about what's happening in Sacramento, what's happening in D.C., and how that could impact you. So make sure you uh, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, and and tune in next week because there's a lot more good stuff coming. So thanks very much, Kevin, and uh, appreciate your time today, and look forward to hearing more next week. Great, we'll be in touch, everybody.